Sun-soaked beaches, clear blue waters, a taste of paradise. Until all hell broke loose and the earth unleashed its fury. First, a massive earthquake, one of the worst ever. Then a mega tsunami wreaking untold destruction. On December 26, 2004, people stared in wonder as the ocean rolled back into the distance. A few minutes later, it returned, growing as it surged forward, rearing up and roaring like several freight trains as it pounded the shore. Locals and holidaymakers were caught completely by surprise. Desperately, they tried to outrun the torrent of water as it began to race inland, pummeling and smashing all in its path. Trees, buildings, boats and furniture were picked up and carried, becoming further instruments of death and injury. The loss of human life was on a monumental scale. Survival was virtually a matter of chance, timing and luck. And I heard a lot of screaming and commotion and just a lot of noise, wondered what it was. So I came, went from there to just to the corner of the car park here by the main road, uh, looked down the street and I could see a lot of people running and screaming and shouting. And I could hear everyone shouting, big wave, big wave. I still didn't really twig what was going on. But a couple of seconds later, there's a little alleyway between the shops there and the water came through at about two meters high. So then I just ran. When the tsunami's power was finally spent, the extent of the devastation was revealed. Closest to the earthquake's epicenter, Indonesia was hit particularly hard. But the tsunami had traveled far, reaching many countries, and always leaving behind a trail of destruction and misery. Thousands of kilometers of coastline had been decimated, villages inundated, and lives shattered. Millions of people had no homes, no sanitation, clean water or food. This was a humanitarian emergency of an unprecedented scale. For holiday makers, December is a perfect time to visit Phuket, Thailand's largest island and popular tourist spot. At Christmas, the weather is ideal, hot but dry. The island's seemingly endless beaches attract people from all over the globe, its squeaky clean white sand and turquoise waters an irresistible lure. It's a bleak cry from European winters, half a world away from sleet, snow and slush. Here, there's time out from the stresses of everyday living. All you have to do is relax. Early on the morning of the 26th of December, the lazy day after Christmas, it was shaping up to be yet another perfect day. On the beaches, all was calm. But far out in the ocean, a cataclysmic event was unfolding. Just before eight in the morning, a massive earthquake 30 kilometers beneath the Indian Ocean ripped open the earth, gouging out a 1,600 kilometer long trench.
the coastal Indonesian city of Banda Aceh, just 160 kilometers from the epicenter, bore the brunt. The tremendous upheaval and pressure of the earthquake forced the seafloor to rise several meters. 30 cubic kilometers of seawater was pushed upwards, radiating out along the entire length of the trench as a series of deadly tsunamis. In Aceh province, at least 150,000 died or were never found, the majority women and children. Half a million people were homeless. The water destroyed over 800 kilometers of coastline, rushing up to five kilometers inland. The tsunami was so powerful that as it surged back to the ocean, many who had survived the initial waves were now swept out to sea. Boats, cars, trucks were picked up and carried by the waters, wreaking further havoc. Entire villages and towns disappeared. Roads, bridges, schools, hospitals were decimated. Suddenly, virtually the entire infrastructure of Banda Aceh was gone. When the waters finally receded, they revealed a disaster of almost biblical proportions. Only a mosque stood amidst this field of death and destruction. Towns had literally been obliterated. Only the foundations remained, along with some debris. The rest had been carried away by the seething waters. Corpses were already beginning to rot in the tropical climate. The injured, were in desperate need of medical attention. Banda Arche was ground zero of one of the worst ever natural disasters. I do hope you could report the sufferings of the people here in Arche. The last three days have been the most difficult days of my presidency and a trying moment for my nations. For 28 years, Arche had been fighting a war for independence. Yet in a matter of just minutes, almost four times as many people were killed by the tsunami than in the decades of civil war. It does remind me of the pictures we see of Nagasaki or Hiroshima, where there was just, I think, one building, one cathedral standing, a gutted cathedral standing, and the rest was leveled, a leveled plain of shards. And that's more or less the situation here. We have one big building to our left, and the rest is just nothing except debris. Arche's real death toll will now never be known. For health reasons, those bodies that were recovered were given a hasty mass burial. Around the globe, a horrified public watched as the tsunami toppled communities like dominoes. International governments and aid agencies moved quickly to provide essential services to stricken areas. Uh, what we're doing here in Ben Arche is providing uh, portable drinking water for the local uh, people of Ben Arche after the tidal wave. Uh, what we can do is 20,000 litres of potable, disinfected, uh, safe drinking water per hour. 
With thousands of dead bodies, sewerage lines ruptured and water supplies contaminated, malaria, cholera and other diseases lurked in the wings. The race was now on to contain the disaster. The 9.3 magnitude earthquake had released surface energy equivalent to 1,500 Hiroshima bombs. This force triggered a succession of waves racing through deep water at 1,000 kilometers per hour, hitting Sri Lanka within two hours. Here, there was no receding sea to forewarn. The first wave hit not as it ebbed, but fully crested. Two-thirds of the country's coastline suffered massive damage. Entire villages were swept away, and 80% of the fishing fleets and harbors were destroyed. One kilometer inland, an overloaded passenger train was lifted by the waters and wrecked, killing 1,800 people. Coming literally out of the blue, the tsunami caught people completely unaware. And suddenly we saw the water advanced. To start with, we thought it was just the sea really just going a little angry. Then um, the second wave was a lot stronger and we rushed upstairs. Um, it happened a few times with about an hour in between. And the third wave that, that hit the hotel devastated the, the bottom half, the lower floors and, and so on. Uh, and we were trapped on the third floor. We were in the room when the big wave came and then it broke the, the, the big window and all of a sudden it was full of water the whole room and then it broke the door and all the furniture went against the door so the door was jammed and we were trapped my wife especially and after a while i was swimming could swim outside and then I got jammed, jammed again on the outside, and I thought I'm, I'd get drowned, you know. The recovery process was daunting. Rebuilding Sri Lanka's infrastructure, housing, and industries would take years and billions of dollars. I think uh, for another uh, four or five years, we won't be able to raise our heads, you know, like uh, to put the place in order. Uh, my property, I think the uh, uh, I have a lot of damages here to put the walls up and to rebuild the building back. You know. Sri Lanka was the hardest hit area after Banda Aceh. 100,000 houses were destroyed, over a million people displaced, and around 40,000 lost their lives. On Thailand's west coast, most areas were badly hit. Close to 5,500 people died in the country, including many foreign tourists. In Phuket, there were around 250 deaths, and the fishing industry and tourist resorts sustained extensive damage. On one beach, the sea's rapid 300-meter retreat prompted locals and tourists to gather on the exposed seabed amidst flopping beached fish. All were trapped when the water surged back in. Elsewhere, a 10-year-old British girl seeing the water recede remembered a recent geography lesson and frantically warned beachgoers, saving 100 lives. A near neighbor of Phuket is Koh Phi Phi, an archipelago of six islands. The largest island houses a popular resort on a strip of land between two picturesque bays. A 2.5 meter wave struck first from one bay, and shortly after from the other side, a second wave, 5.5 meters high. 70% of the town's buildings were destroyed. 200 holiday bungalows were carried out to sea, some occupied at the time. By the middle of the following year, 2,000 people were known to be dead or missing. Local tour guides, however, believed the real figure to be double that amount. India suffered the third most fatalities, with an estimated 18,000 deaths, and the state of Tamil Nadu was hit very hard. 
the human tragedy was heartbreaking. So many of the dead were children, swept away by the water in front of horrified parents. Bodies were dumped randomly as the waves left, in trees tangled in power lines, half buried in muddy slopes. Fishing suffered severely. Only three of 15,000 boats were not damaged during the tsunami. Plantations and fields were poisoned by seawater and layers of sediment. It would need a very long time for this region to recover. The tsunamis traveled far, registering on meters in the Antarctic, Canada, and South America. A young man taking his first ever swim became Kenya's sole casualty. Naomba kuondoka na meteorological department. Manake wanasema kwamba bahari maji yatainuka 20 meters above the normal sea level na ni hatari. Kwa hivyo jamaa mnaomba mapema mapema kuondoka. 16 hours after the quake and 8,500 kilometers away, the tsunami reached South Africa where it claimed two lives. In Somalia, almost 300 were estimated to have died. Even so far away, the waves were still lethal. During the afternoon, 18 months later, an undersea earthquake of magnitude 7.7 .7 struck off the coast of Java, Indonesia. Within about 20 minutes, a three-meter high tsunami slammed into a 180-kilometer stretch of coastline. Witnesses described it as a black wall of water that surged several hundred meters inland. Hundreds of low-lying fishing villages were inundated, and houses, resorts, boats, and shops were smashed to pieces. The tsunami caused major destruction and loss of life. The confirmed number of dead and missing was well over 700. Around 70,000 people were left homeless, and many thousands fled the area, terrified of further waves. For decades, the Pacific Ocean region had used an extensive tsunami warning system. But until 2004, the Indian Ocean region was not considered at risk, and no warning systems were in place. Clearly, that had to change. We are starting up the world's most advanced tsunami early warning system, able to issue the quickest possible warnings with a high degree of reliability. The complex system can predict, map, and warn of an impending tsunami just minutes after an earthquake. Keberadaan sistem peringatan dini tsunami merupakan wujud kemajuan dan kesiapsiagaan kita dalam upaya mencegah atau paling tidak dalam upaya mengurangi dampak dari bahaya gempa bumi dan tsunami yang dapat timbul kapan saja dan di mana saja. In 2009, 18 countries took part in an Indian Ocean tsunami drill to test public preparedness and data communications. It began with a mock earthquake. In Indonesia, the nationwide drill was realistic, involving young and old, even pregnant women, as a true test of a likely emergency. Within minutes of the earthquake, emergency procedures began. Wailing sirens and loudspeakers alerted people to head for higher ground and quake-proof emergency shelters. The military emergency response was enacted, and fake wounded, complete with bandages, were assisted by friends and relatives in a simulation of the 2004 tsunami. The test achieved its aims. People understood what they had to do, and any procedural and communication flaws were exposed and remedied. It was a valuable and worthwhile exercise although for many, a little too realistic, a frightening reminder of 2004. 
Unlike many other regions, the post-tsunami recovery in Thailand was very quick. Within weeks, beaches were cleaned up, buildings were repaired, and the reconstruction process was begun. Many of the resorts were back in business by February 2005. For Phuket, the tourist industry is a mainstay of the economy, and it was essential to get this up and running as quickly as possible. However, getting the tourists back was not necessarily going to be easy. We have uh, put in place uh, uh, very strong emergency uh, procedures for tsunami, yeah, and we are offering in the moment very attractive rate on, on the Thai market and on the international market. The Thai economy is more robust than that of many of the other tsunami-affected nations. The government injected funds into the economy to help restore tourism, backed by extensive advertising, and was an early proponent of the tsunami warning system. Even so, tourists have been slow to return. Phuket has made the strongest recovery, but locals talk about what they call the economic tsunami. 2005's tourism revenue plunged, and it will take many years to recover. In Thailand, as in so many countries, the pain of the tsunami still lingers. Of the 5,000 deaths in Thailand, almost 2,000 were in the province of Pang Na. Five years after the tsunami, thousands of locals in a small Pang Na fishing village took part in a memorial for the many who had died. Mourners paid tribute to loved ones, and Buddhist, Christian, and Muslim ceremonies were held with prayers for those who had died. The waves swept away so much that mattered dearly. Loved ones, communities, even a sense of place and belonging. The 2004 tsunami will remain a painful memory for years to come for people all around the world. No matter what we might wish, we cannot dodge natural disasters. We can't prevent another earthquake or another tsunami. But we can at least learn from the past. We can be prepared, and we can hope that this will make the next time a little less painful.